Thanks. So thanks again for joining us um, for tonight's history program with the topic of deconstructing King's Chapel, examining class, race, and gender through architecture and material culture. Um, our program is the second part of our history programming um, for Ma National Preservation Month. Um, each May is an opportunity to celebrate historic places throughout the United States um, and the role of place in preserving and ensuring our nation's history. This year, the Preservation Month theme from the National Trust for Historic Preservation is telling the full story, um, which provides the opportunity to focus on less dominant and historically marginalized stories um, and places in our nation's history, and to focus on sharing um, the fuller and more truthful histories that surround us. Um, so with over 300 years of history within the walls of King Chapel's 270 year old church. Um, the building itself provides a lot of insights into the chapel social history and remnants of the past throughout the building, um, both intentionally preserved throughout our history and also those previously removed, um, can help inform us about the lives and challenges faced by congregants um, and members over the previous three centuries. Um, so the stories this building shares and of the people connected to it teach us about themes of belonging and exclusion, power and privilege, um, and the stories of Bostonians who have often been excluded from the history books. Um, so tonight we'll focus on, um, quote unquote, deconstructing King's Chapel, um, exploring themes, again, of class, race, and gender as they are found um, or were previously found in the building structure and decor. Um, so we're going to focus on three main um, topics with relation to that. Um, one being the church's um, seating style or box views. Um, we're also going to speak about the church crypt and also look at some of the decor in the building in the form of the memorials in order to help us achieve this goal. Um, but today's program um, is in part focused on the building itself. Um, it's worth briefly discussing how the current building came to be. Um, so King's Chapel was founded um, back in 1686. Um, in June of that year, the congregation um, that became King's Chapel held its first public services. Um, in the library of the townhouse, which um, later became the old state house, and the church was formally established the following week. Um, but the King's Chapel and its um, early leaders struggled to find a permanent home for their church. Um, finally, in 1688, the royal governor, Edmund Andros, essentially used the power of eminent domain to claim a portion of public lands in the city to build the chapel. Um, and that land, which is kind of highlighted here in this blank section, um, next to this illustration of the chapel on um, a colonial map um, was part of a public burying ground. Although the burying ground next to the chapel um, now shares its name, this burying ground predates the chapel by over 50 years. Um, it was the first English burying ground in Boston. Um, and the language we use to describe this land is important. Um, we add the qualifier um, in our programming and in conversations about this place. Um, that is the first or oldest English burying ground to acknowledge the longer indigenous history of the land and the region. Um, the land colonized by groups like the Puritans and now referred to as the state of Massachusetts is the homeland to the Massachusetts, Wampi Wampanoag, Mashpee Wampanoag, um, Akina Wampanoag, um, and Nutmack tribes. When the governor decided to build the chapel um, on this half of the burying grounds, um, any graves on this land were relocated elsewhere in the burying grounds. Um, while this may sound strange um, to some contemporary viewers, um, this practice is actually very common historically um, of second burials and is still practiced um, throughout the world today, um, including um, removing or relocating burials to mass graves or charnel houses designated to hold bones um, to serve a common practice. Um, so after the land was claimed for this purpose um, and some of the graves were relocated, um, construction began on a small wooden chapel um, that opened its doors for worship in 1689. Um, but um, as you can see from this image and for those of you who have um, been to King Chapel, we're no longer in a small wooden church today. Um, in the early 1700s, Boston continued to grow as a major colonial port, um, including becoming a part of the Atlantic triangular slave trade. And the city attracted English colonists, um, many of whom were businessmen or merchants, and many of whom weren't Puritan. Um, the growing number of Anglicans in Boston um, eventually put stress on the small and crowded um, wooden King's Chapel, 
And by the early 1720s, King's Chapel had um, spun off a daughter church, Old North Church. Um, and by the 1740s, the original wooden building was starting to fall into disrepair um, and simply wasn't large enough to serve its congregation. Um, so the building today, which you're seeing on your screen, um, was commissioned and designed um, by architect Peter Harrison in the 1740s. Um, it was completed between 1747 and 1754 um, and retains many of its original elements, um, including its box pews. Um, so the box pews, um, the most dominant kind of embodiment of these histories is often um, one of the first things that visitor no visitors notice when they come to King's Chapel for the first time. Um, and as I said, it's our distinct style of church seating um, known as box pews. The style of church seating was actually um, extremely common in Northern Europe and the American colonies um, until the early 19th century and wasn't exclusively um, found in Anglican churches. Uh, the style um, in the colonies was also seen in Puritan churches um, and in other countries other than England as well um, in Europe. Across these different churches, um, the boxes were typically sold to congregants as a way to provide private space for families to worship. Um, as well as raise money to support the church. The practice in return created a visible social hierarchy within each congregation um, based on varied pew pricing. Um, here at King's Chapel, the most expensive pews historically were located down the center aisle um, and became kind of less expensive as you moved outwards and upwards um, and even factored in discounts for things like obstructed views from columns. Um, so, the image here, kind of the, the pews along the center aisle would have been kind of the, the most expensive um, pews um, in that hierarchy. And once you move to the outer columns and against the outer walls, and then upstairs, um, the pricing uh, varied in the social st status um, of members and congregants was reflected um, by where they sat. So um, here's one example of a historic pew map with lists and costs um, from various periods in the church's history. Um, this is a colonial era um, seating arrangement uh, from sometime before the American Revolution, um, kind of probably 1760s, 1750s, 1760s, um, based on the folks who are here at that time. Um, but you can see, looking at it, kind of the front is labeled as chancel, um, and this is a pretty accurate representation of the floor plan of the church today because uh, we do have our original seating arrangement in pews. Um, and in some cases here, you'll see uh, the prices of pews as well. Um, so for instance, um, pew number 30 here uh, is listed as 12 pounds. Um, and on the other side of the screen, there are some that um, are listed with prices as well, 16 pounds, six pounds, although this is kind of at the very front of the building, this would have been considered um, a lesser, less valuable pew um, because it was located kind of off in the corner um, behind the pulpit. Um, while the exact ex currency exchanges are very difficult um, to do for a variety of reasons about just how much life has changed um, over the course of our history. Uh, we do not know that we know in the mid 18th century, um, pews typically cost between 15 pounds and 30 pounds. Um, so they were pretty expensive, um, but there was a range of that as well. And in some ways it could be considered like a luxury purchase. Um, to give you kind of an idea of what that money uh, looked like at that time, at the time that the church pews were ranging from like 15 to 30 British pounds, um, the minister's annual salary was about 150 pounds. Um, so that's a pretty significant um, portion um, of your salary. Um, this is a 19th century seating map of the chapel, um, which you can see it's labeled plan and taxes of the pews in the church. Um, so these are the yearly contributions that members would pay to maintain their membership um, to become an official um, kind of voting member who could participate in church politics until about 1920. Um, you would be required at King's Chapel to be a member of the proprietor of pews, meaning that you were a pew holder. Um, 
And you can see as well um, the kind of the prices here and how they do change depending on the location. Um, but what's interesting here is that by the kind of mid to late 19th century, the gallery pews um, were actually changed very much in how they were viewed by the church itself um, as a moneymaker, as a status symbol, um, because historically um, it was a very different situation uh, with the seating when you got into the gallery. Um, many wealthy white congregants own several pews, um, and those congregants who were enslavers uh, often uh, forced the people they enslaved to attend services um, at the church. Um, enslaved and free people of color in New England churches, um, King's Chapel included, were often made to sit in the gallery levels. Um, and these choices were institutionalized through votes by the church leadership. Um, as you walk through the gallery um, or observe the gallery in the chapel, um, it's an important opportunity to reflect on Boston's difficult history with enslavement um, and the institution's lasting legacies into more recent history um, in the present. Um, King's Chapel, of course, is not unique in this history. Um, it's a shared history across churches, uh, with churches across Christian denominations um, in Boston and throughout the American colonies. Um, from the church's opening through the 19th century, uh, we do know that the building was segregated, um, not just by social standing, as discussed a little earlier, but also by race. Um, while worthy merchant class um, congregants worshipped from their elaborately decorated pews on the first floor, the gallery um, was predominantly seating for members who either could not afford a pew downstairs, um, strangers, which referred to non-members of the church or visitors, and people of color who were barred from worshiping on the ground level um, through institutional decisions. Although the first specific record um, doesn't appear until um, kind of the early 1700s, um, we do know that uh, the earliest vote on segregation of the building that we have seen in our records um, comes from a vote of the vestry in July of 1701. Um, and we see these decisions um, taking place and being reinforced through the votes of the church leadership um, for decades to come. Um, this is one example on the screen here. This is the 1701 um, record I mentioned. Um, at the first Warden's and Vestry record after the Stone Chapel opens um, in 1754, so the current building, um, the church leadership um, continued their vote segregating the building, um, barring all people of color um, from the first floor of the church during services. Um, I don't have an image of that document um, from our records, uh, but this is another um, example of one of these votes um, on segregated seating. So this is from the church records from 1736. Um, Similar votes also appear in the early records of Christ Church Boston, um, which is better known as the Old North Church, which was that 1723 offshoot of King's Chapel I mentioned. Um, their votes uh, doesn't specifically kind of mention where people of color would be sent to sit in the chapel, um, but it does specifically say that they're not allowed um, to be in certain areas of the building. Um, Um, by 1804, uh, however, we start to see um, changes in the way that King's Chapel is viewing um, their gallery seating um, through a new votes in the, um, of, in the vestry records. Um, in 1804, um, King's Chapel began um, making renovations in various um, building improvements to the gallery level. Um, and began selling the pews for a higher rate, um, having voted, quote, that a committee be appointed to prepare the pews in the South Gallery for selling by fitting them up in such a manner as shall be most for the interested of the church, of the accommodation of the proprietors, and shouting, shutting out transient company. Um, so this is an interesting 
um, vote that we see in which the church is um, intentionally trying to keep to trying to um, cater to their members um, and at the same time kind of intentionally looking to prevent visitors and non-members um, from worshiping in this space, um, which of course is very different from how we view church membership and inclusion um, today. As I mentioned earlier, um, after this vote and after work starts to happen um, in the gallery level, the pews there um, become increasingly more expensive. In this particular um, meeting in 1804, they decided they might be able to sell pews, the better pews in the gallery for $150, um, which in 1804 would have been a pretty, pretty decent amount of money. Um, other sources um, indicate that the church um, did continue to maintain seating specifically for people of color and African Americans until the 1840s. Um, there's a note from a former church minister in a book he wrote on the history that says, quote, the seats intended for Blacks were ordered to be removed July 20th, 1844. Um, but this raises several questions. Um, at what point would people of color have been barred? Um, would they have been barred from sitting in the pews entirely? Were there other pews available to them? Um, did they realize that or decide that they no longer needed this section? Um, so it really kind of raises more questions um, than answers. Um, it also appears um, through our records uh, that seating segregation, whether officially or socially enforced, continued um, through the 19th century and um, into the early 20th century um, from recollections from former members. Um, and what has been recorded in church histories. Um, many churches in the Eastern United States maintain the box pew system of membership and participation, as I mentioned earlier, through the 19th century. Um, private pew ownership at King's Chapel um, continued until about 1920, when the church restructured its membership system um, and established the Society of King's Chapel. Um, and since then, the church has been um, an open congregation, placing no restrictions on membership or participation um, in worship or church leadership. Um, while privately owned pews and membership based on pew ownership are no longer in practice and the church is committed to remaining open and welcoming to all who wish to worship, um, it's important to reflect on this aspect of our history um, and kind of pay attention to what kind of buildings can tell us about our past. Um, while less frequently seen, um, the church's crypt um, also speaks to the dynamics of class, um, race, and gender in the church's history. Um, and it actually has a decent amount of similarities um, to the pew system as well. Um, the crypt beneath the church, uh, which is made up of 21 vaulted brick tombs, um, essentially in the basement level of the chapel, dates back to the 1750s. Um, when the stone chapel was completed, uh, but we do know that there were a number of burials that took place beneath the original chapel as well. Um, while this space is only one of only few surviving crypts um, in or colonial era crypts in New England, um, in the United States, this style of burial um, was more common practice um, in England amongst Anglicans, um, as well as throughout Europe. Um, Anglicans who worshiped here um, often did believe in some social or religious significance um, in terms of where or how someone was buried. Um, and Anglicans often choose to be buried in their church crypts um, or church graveyards associated with their churches um, in efforts to stay in close proximity um, to the church where they worshiped um, and uh, to living relatives. Um, much like the box pews in the sanctuary above, um, where you were buried um, did speak to your social standing and privilege in colonial Boston. Um, not all members of King's Chapel were buried in the crypt, as much like the pews above. Um, most of the tombs, so 20 out of 21 tombs in the crypt, were privately owned by wealthy white families. Um, being able to have your remains 
at least temporarily interred in this space, um, was a privilege that was reserved during the colonial era um, and into the 19th century for um, an elite merchant class. Um, looking at this map here, uh, much like the maps of the pews we saw a little earlier, this is um, a late 18th century um, map of the crypt um, showing kind of the layout of tombs and the owners at the time. Um, and one interesting thing uh, to note here um, is all but one of the tombs uh, were owned by men. Um, taking a closer look at the names on the map, um, Grizel Apthorpe, who uh, became the owner of pew number two, um, is the only woman listed as owning a tomb. Um, her ownership does speak to her level of status um, and privilege in 18th century Boston, um, as well as within the church itself. Um, while we unfortunately don't at this time um, have detailed records of the cost of tombs, um, they would have been considered um, a luxury item um, for wealthy members of the church. Um, in the 1700s, um, the majority of wealth in colonial Boston um, and the tombs beneath the church uh, was held by white men, um, most of whom were merchants, um, doctors, and lawyers. That holds pretty true across the names of the tomb owners who appear um, in the records here. Um, Grizel Apthorpe um, would only become a tomb owner following the death of her husband, um, Charles Apthorpe, who was a wealthy merchant and slave trader. Um, the Apthorpes, of course, are just one of several families buried in the crypt um, who enslaved people of African and Native American descent. Um, at this time, we do not know where enslaved people whose burial services were held at King's Chapel were buried. Um, nor do we know the burial locations of free black families who worshiped at King's Chapel um, during the time the crypt was in use, despite records of their funeral services being held here. Um, but looking closer at something as seemingly basic as the names of tomb owners um, helps reveal the extent of inequalities in colonial America um, and how social inequalities based on race, gender, and class um, could even follow early Bostonians to the grave. Um, as I mentioned, all but one of the tombs in the crypt were um, family owned. Um, the 21st tomb, um, which is shown on your screen here, um, is called the Stranger's Tomb um, and has a kind of distinct history from the other tombs that we've discussed. Um, this tomb um, is essentially beneath the entranceway of the church, um, in some ways tucked away at the back of the crypt, um, and was used as a, by the church as a burial space um, for a variety of people. And as I said, goes um, by the name of the stranger's tomb. Um, unlike the people interred in the member-owned tombs, which are typically members of single families, um, those buried inside the stranger's tomb were typically unrelated and unconnected to one another. Um, and in some cases, they had never stepped foot in King's Chapel during their lifetimes, making them strangers to the church itself. Um, but this is an important kind of um, insight into kind of the differences um, in terms of class and burial um, at King's Chapel and um, in colonial Boston. Um, the stranger's tomb was essentially used for um, as a charity tomb um, by the church. However, uh, they are, there are some indications that um, they may have provided um, burials to former um, sextons um, in the stranger's tomb um, out of their service um, to the church. Um, but for the most part, uh, it was um, visitors from out of town, um, sailors, travelers who died in Boston would be buried in stranger's tombs um, either here um, at Old North Church um, or Stranger's Tombs um, in the various burying grounds and later cemeteries um, as well. Um, there are also a number of records um, in our burial registers that indicate that there may have been um, some correlation um, or relationship between King's Chapel um, and the almshouses in Boston, um, and there may have been um, burial arrangements um, between the two 
as well, based on um, some of the names and descriptions that appear in our Braille registers. Um, Uh, returning upstairs um, to the sanctuary, um, it's a little hard to see um, in this picture, um, but along the walls of the first floor, um, hardly any wall space um, is untouched by a plaque or sculpture that's dedicated to a um, former member of the church community. Um, so now we're trying to look at kind of a little bit more of the decorative and material culture um, aspect in the form of memorials. Um, the memorials around the church illustrate um, the wealth of individual members and families, um, indicate key members of the church community, and share um, you know, insights on what qualities and collective values um, were esteemed by the congregation members at the time that each memorial um, was installed. Um, this comes out of an English tradition, um, and <clears throat> Several of the memorials um, that appear in King Chapel were even carved by prominent English um, sculptors of the day, uh, whose work can be found um, at Westminster Abbey and Oxford University, as well as um, in historic churches throughout London. Um, and this, again, speaks um, to class and wealth in colonial Boston. Um, particularly the wealth accumulated by some of the colonial families that worshiped at the church, um, including, for instance, um, Charles Apthorpe, um, who I mentioned uh, when talking about the crypt um, and his wife taking over ownership of his tomb. Um, the, after Charles Apthorpe's death, um, his wife, Grizel Apthorpe and children, um, commissioned and imported a sculpture um, for his memorial plaque. Um, to be carved and shipped over from England by one of these prominent um, sculptors, um, which helped like visually reinforce um, that level of status and wealth within uh, the church space. Um, there are 34 memorials um, throughout King's Chapel Sanctuary um, with 52 names inscribed on them. Um, uh, it's important to note, um, and what we're looking at here, um, is that 84% of the names on the plaques um, are of men, um, and 100% of the names um, are of white individuals. Um, to stress, kind of, again, a key theme when we talk about memorials, um, each tells us more than simply about the person described um, in marble um, or whatever the memorial is made of. Um, we learn about the people who erected it and their values about the time they lived in and how they wanted future generations um, to remember um, their times and their loved ones. Um, so here, um, we'll take this as an opportunity to kind of reflect more on um, gender in the church's history and how um, it's seen or not seen um, through the memorials throughout the church. Um, the first memorial erected in the church um, was actually erected to honor a woman, um, Frank, Frances Shirley, um, but there would not be a second um, memorial honoring a woman for 150 years. Um, Frances Shirley uh, is pictured here um, in a portrait as well as a picture of um, her memorial in the chapel. Um, of the women memorialized in the church, only two of them are kind of physically depicted, um, and Frances Shirley is one of those women. Um, this sculpture um, and memorial were commissioned by uh, her widower, um, Royal Governor William Shirley, um, while the church was being built um, and honors the memory of his wife and daughter. Um, while Francis Shirley um, would have worshipped in the wooden chapel, um, she actually passed away before the completion of the current building, um, which she is memorialized in. The memorial um, also honors um, her daughter, Frances, um, who died in childbirth in 1745. Um, and the two women are described in words um, that seem to convey kind of the societal ideals for um, an English woman in mid and 
18th century England or New England. Um, the inscription is in Latin, but focuses um, on a number of qualities as well as physical attributes um, ranging from beauty, compassion, prudence, piety, um, being motherly, benevolent, virtuous, and more. Um, so we see how kind of these women are being reflected upon um, as opposed to kind of how um, these women would have kind of viewed themselves during their lives. Um, the monument was designed by one of the best known English sculptors of the day, um, Peter Shoemakers, um, shortly before beginning his work on the Shirley Memorial for King's Chapel. Um, he had made a name for himself in 1740 after creating um, the William Shakespeare Memorial um, for Poets Corner at Westminster Abbey, um, which is home to 15 of his other works. Um, the Francis Shirley Memorial at King's Chapel um, kind of exists at the intersection of class and gender. Um, her husband's rank as a colonial official and governor um, created the opportunity for her memory being preserved physically in the building, um, as well as her husband's ability to commission and transport um, the Schumacher Memorial from London to Boston um, was a sign of he and his family's wealth and influence. Um, the memorial then would not have only functioned, um, the church is attesting to the memory of these two women, um, but also to the family's affluence and influence in the church and city. Um, the only other memorial in the church um, that depicts um, a former woman um, of King Chapel is the Ella Lyman Cabot Memorial. Um, which is actually a bit tucked away. Um, it's located one of the stairwells as you're walking up to the gallery level. Um, and it's this plaque on the wall um, with a silhouette of Ella Lyman Cabot, um, as well as the dates of her life, um, 1866 to 1934. Um, she was also born into um, wealthy families um, into the, both the Lowell and Lyman families um, and dedicated most of her adults um, put to education and her career. Um, after studying um, at Bradford College, she pursued graduate education at Harvard, um, but due to her gender was unable to receive a degree um, at that time. Um, however, she dove into a long career as an educator, um, teaching ethics, psychology and philosophy courses. Um, and she was also a long-term um, director of King Chapel Sunday School, um, where she restructured the program um, to better serve the students and incorporated kind of modern um, education techniques and strategies. Um, the photograph on the left of your screen um, is a picture of Ella Lyman Cabot teaching a Sunday school class um, in the 19 teens. Um, but she spent kind of most of her career um, kind of fighting for formal recognition um, in a male dominated field. Um, she ultimately did serve on a number of um, boards, including um, the Board of Radcliffe College and the Massachusetts Board of Education. Um, but in many ways, she never received kind of full recognition for her contributions. Um, I think it's interesting to, um, to look at the evolution of memorials in the chapel. This, of course, comes from a much later period than that of Francis Shirley, um, but there's kind of no description or kind of depiction um, in words of Ella Cabot, um, her life, her interests, things like that. Um, and it does become kind of less of, of a trend to have these kind of flowery descriptions as we kind of progress through the church's history. Um, but the memorial was um, installed by her husband, um, Robert Clark Cabot, um, after her death, um, who also um, established a trust in her honor um, to aid individuals in affecting positive change in the world. Um, and that kind of is her part of her legacy beyond the church. Um, 
We also um, talk about Helen Holmans, um, who is the second name on the church's World War I memorial. Um, and is the only um, woman in the church on one of our um, three war memorials. Um, she was born in 1884 um, and came from a medical family um, and spent a lot of time um, in her early career um, volunteering at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, but um, also spent a lot of time in France. So when World War I broke out, um, she volunteered um, at a field hospital beginning in May 1915, um, prior to US um, involvement in the war. Um, for the next three years, she worked at a number of military hospitals, field hospitals, evacuation hospitals, and ambulance units throughout France. Um, and over the course of a few short years, she went um, from a being a hospital volunteer in Boston um, to a full-fledged nurse overseeing her own unit um, in France. Um, but unfortunately, she died as, of um, influenza um, just five days before the armistice, the end of the war in 1918. Um, Helen's name, um, as I said, is included on the church's um, World War I memorial above the entranceway alongside um, two men. Um, and she's one of only six women, as I said, honored in memorials um, in the church. Um, although she was honored in the church um, and in a similar way to um, the two men who appear on the memorial as well. Um, this is um, an interesting instance of um, who is included and who is excluded in some ways. Um, the Coolidge, Holmans, and Robbins family um, pushed for the installation of this memorial um, and ended up having to raise the funds um, for it themselves, essentially. Um, and because of that, uh, they, they were kind of in charge of determining who um, would appear on the memorial um, and who would be excluded, which is interesting. Um, while she was included um, and memorialized at her church, um, she was notably excluded initially from um, memorialization at Harvard's Memorial Chapel, which, um, which was built and dedicated to Harvard um, students and members of the Harvard community who um, died during the First World War. Um, but Helen, um, as well as two other women who attended Radcliffe College, um, were excluded from the memorialization there um, due to their gender um, until 2001, um, when they were finally recognized for their role in the war. Um, so with that, it kind of brings us to a close as to looking at um, some of the ways that we can um, reflect on um, social history in terms of class, um, race, and gender through various aspects of the building um, itself um, in terms of the way the church um, is physically constructed and decorated. Um, I hope it's been an interesting um, time to kind of reflect on the kind of physicality of the building and how we can look into that um, and examine more um, of the kind of human perspective and also see how um, architecture and interior decor kind of can uphold um, social restrictions um, and things like that. So with that, um, we will move into our question portion. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to jump in and answer them. Um, as well, I want to flag for your attention, um, our next history program um, is a collaboration with the Longfellow House in Washington Headquarters National Historic Site, um, which is part of the National Park Service located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, our next program will be on Thursday, June 10th um, at 5.30 p.m. Two weeks from now, um, it's presented by Park Ranger Megan Mitchell, and the uh, title is Let Me Be All Yours, the topic of romantic friendship of Charles Sumner and Samuel Billy Howe. Um, so I hope you will join us then. Um, and with that, we will move into questions.